Hello fellow podcasters. Today I've got The Labors of Hercules by Agatha Christie, the master of mystery herself. And well, let's get straight into the review. So basically this book is 12 short stories and each of these short story mysteries are allegories of each of the 12 labors of Hercules within common mythology. And honestly, I enjoyed it a lot. And since it's a mystery book, this review will be pretty short because again, the mystery book, the entire point of a mystery book is the plot. And I don't want to spoil it to you because, you know, the entire point of that, right? So I'll talk about each uh, story and generally the synopsis and what it's kind of about. And I'll also talk a little bit about what I like about this book. So let's get straight into it. So uh, the book actually starts with a short little kind of prologue scene where essentially Poro is told by his friends like, oh, you know, like, you don't read the classics, man. You don't read myth. You don't read literature. That's a little bit sad. And Poirot is like, yeah, that, that is a little bit sad. And then he thinks about it a little bit and he decides he's going to read The Labors of Hercules because he's named after Hercules. And after he reads it, he says, take this Hercules, this hero. Hero indeed. What was he but a large muscular creature of low intelligence and criminal tendency? So he basically thinks that Hercules that he has been named after the great hero is no nothing but a muscular guy with a lot of criminal tendencies which to Poro is a red flag but he decides since he's retiring soon why not go out in fashion he decides that he will take 12 cases 12 cases of special value each of which will will reflect one of the Herculean labors and yeah that's basically what the entire book is about so the first, the first case is the Nemean lion, and it seems to be a minor case because the the uh, a wife's Polychines dog is stolen and ransomed away, and it's Paro's job to find out who's running this weird dog stealing business, and so yeah, he starts doing that, um, and that that's the entire that's the entire book, and, and that's the entire story. And you might think like Polychines, it's boring, man, it's boring. But think about them. Hey, it's Christie. What meets the eye is never, ever what you get out from a Christie book. The most benign of mysteries can turn into a murder mystery. So be aware of that. Afterwards, the Lernian Hydra, which is the second story. Um, there's a gossip that this doctor killed his wife to marry a pretty younger woman. And Paro goes there in order to find the root of the issue and destroy it, just like the Lemian Hydra, because you know, you can't kill a Hydra unless you put it on fire or you cut off its original head. And that's very difficult concerning every time you cut a Hydra's head off, uh, it'll split into two, just like a really annoying, vague rumor. So Poirot goes around and tries his best to find who killed who. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really, really fun. And honestly, like, each of these stories, what they have in common is that they're so compact and Christy has mastered the art of, like, compressing these little, little foreshadowing points, this, these little points that add up to this perfect picture. And this, this short story is just another great example of that. Uh, the next story is the Arcadian Deer, uh, which is a very kind of a romantic kind of a Christy story because, let's be honest, a lot of Christie's main themes are about love and obsession. Um, and this is about a young man asking Poro to find a beautiful maid that he fell in love with um, and try to find her because she disappeared and apparently she just hurried away and she just poofed and she's like, you know, she they were serious, right? It wasn't like a one-off thing, like she was in love with him too, so she was wondering if something bad happened to her and she wants to see her again. And Poro, after listening in, goes around like the entire world trying to find this guy's crush, basically. But it's a little more complicated than that, and you guys will probably like the twist. It's a very nice, comfy, kind of almost like this fuzzy romantic story, almost, basically. Well, as romantic as a Christie mystery can get. Next is the Erymanthian Boar. And this is a more classic kind of hold-up mystery, where essentially Poro is still in that area of the Earth where it's very cold and there's a lot of mountains, and he decides he's gonna go up to a very high altitude at a hotel that's very secluded from real life, where he meets on the way, on the way up to the mountain to the hotel, he, he hears from a police inspector that apparently a bunch of murderers, very famous murderers, are gonna be rendered 
are going to be meeting at the top of the hotel. And that's not good. And we've been wanting to catch this murder for a very long time. So Paul tries to do just that. And this, I think, is another great example of Christie being simply superior than any other mystery author because if it was any other mystery author, that that hotel story would have taken 200 pages and it wouldn't have been as, as compelling either. But Christie manages to pack such a well-written mystery in such a short time. I, she just has this ultimate formula and it's absolutely admirable. Then we've got the audience stables, which is clearing a name and a rumor with another rumor was using natural force. It's very political. I really like that one. And then there is the Stymphalian birds. Um, there's a guy named Harold who's like a politician. Um, there's a girl involved who's apparently being abused by his husband. And then one thing leads to another thing and the husband comes in and the husband dies and then suddenly Harold is now being blackmailed apparently and Poirot is just kind of there and ends up being there and tries to solve the mystery. And it's a really, really funny story honestly. It's almost comedic, horrifying, but comedic. And one thing I'm, I, makes me want to learn more languages. That's all I'm going to say. Then is the Creighton Bull. Uh, someone is supposedly going mad and madness runs in the family, but the woman who is engaged to the man who is going mad is very, very sure that he is definitely not mad. Very interesting story as well. And uh, there's also a common element of drugs have drugs. There's a lot of drugs in, in these stories. I, I don't know why. Maybe maybe the metaphor was easier that way, but you no, know, that, that is what it is. The Horses of Diomedes is directly about drugs. It's about a drug party, a colonel, drugs going around, trying to find the origin of their drugs and because it ruins people's lives. It, it's a very effective anti-drug campaign. It's also just a really good compact Agatha Christie mystery. The Girdle of Hippolyta, this girl disappears off a train that, from a moving train. There's no way she could have jumped off. She's like a fragile little girl. And we don't know how she got there. We don't know how that happened. So we were trying to do something. Meanwhile, Poirot is given the mission to find a missing Reuben. So those two things are probably connected, knowing Christy. Then we got the Flock of the Gurian. It's about a cult and basically exposing the cult for being what it is, a money laundering scam, taking people's wills and monies and, you know, the whole bunch. Usually cults are like that. And then the Apples of Hesperides, uh, finding a golden cup for a very famous collector. It actually has a lot of interesting moral themes within it that I found very, very compelling. And then the capture of Severus, which is the final story. Uh, Countess Vera Rosikoff makes another appearance. She hasn't appeared since One to Buck My Shoe, and it's kind of like Par's crush almost kind of thing. Um, there's a bar called Hell, there's drugs involved, drugs again, and, and that's the whole story. So those are the 12 labors of Hercules. Now, uh, an overall rating. First off, again, it's extremely impressive that Christie manages to kind of almost in in just one chapter, right? In, in an almost that would only be a chapter, in in just a short time, create so much drama and do so much good characterization, and absolutely like enrapture you in the mystery. It's crazy. Like she's figured out the perfect formula of characterization plot setting and foreshadowing that still feels natural even after all these books, even though it's this short. And that's absolutely crazy and it's lovely. And there's something to, I think, take away here as an author on like these lessons on how to create these kind of plot twists. Um, also, I thought I love always in Christie books, I love how there's always these undertones of morality, of love, of chivalry. And it's all very like romantic and also kind of cool and very like melodramatic. And that is something that I really, really like about the Christie mysteries because it doesn't try to be something greater than a murder mystery or, or whatever mystery or like a crime investigation type of thing. But it always has this like a deeper thematic meaning than just just a sim just like a brain dead pulp fiction kind of thing, right? So it's almost like it never pretends to be greater than it is, but it has this depth that other mystery books don't have. It's not a cheap thrill. It makes you think, it makes you, it gives you a lesson. And that's something I really love. And that's about it. Christy, always on top of her game. I would definitely recommend this. I read this over like Christmas time because personally I think Christy books are great over Christmas time. It makes you feel fuzzy. It's great. It's suspenseful. So that's about it. And like always, your plot quester, Aaron the plot quester, would highly recommend any Christy book. Have a great day.